Hi everyone, welcome. My name is Yuying Liu. Today I'm going to present you one of our recent works, which is called Hierarchical Deep Learning of Multi-Scale Differential Equation Time Steppers. And this is a joint work with my advisors, Nathan Kuz and Steve Brunton. So after this video, if you are interested in this work, you are more than welcome to check out our archive and also my GitHub page for more details of this project. Okay, so before entering the main context of this paper, I'm, go uh, I'm gonna to briefly talk about two different regimes of dynamics modeling, okay? So traditionally, when we try to understand the dynamics, what we usually do is basically say, uh, we want to derive a set of differential equations first via some first principles. For example, for this pendulum, we're gonna use like Newton's law, which will give us like a set of equations that, de that describe the dynamics here. And after we have a set of differential equations, we are interested in the solutions of such equations. But since most of the interesting dynamics are nonlinear in nature, and these equations do not admit closed form analytical solutions, and that's why we often use the computers to run simulations on them. And uh, there are a bunch of time-stepping schemes for us, like prepared in the field of numerical analysis to help us run simulations on these systems. For example, one of the most popular time-stepping scheme uh, is the fourth order Runge kata scheme, which has a local truncation error of O delta T to the fifth order. Uh, the reason why it's called fourth order Runge kata is because like the global error it's O delta T to the fourth. <coughs> However, here I want to point out that um, for these simulations we conduct, each step we're gonna have some small error, although the error would be small if you choose this delta T to be very small. However, these um, errors will inevitably accumulate as you do the simulations. So this problem makes uh, the simulation of these chaotic systems very challenging. Why? For example, this Lorentz system, these chaotic systems are very sensitive to the initial conditions. Any discrepancies uh, in the initial time frame will be exponentially expanded and cascaded to the future. That's the problem. Okay, now let's talk about the second regime. Uh, the second regime is about like <coughs> Uh, when we try to model more complex dynamics, for example, the human brain nowadays, it's really, really not easy to derive a set of governing equations via some first principles, right? So what we're gonna do with this system is that we're gonna collect the experimental data from it. We record um, the brain activities. And uh, uh, the data typical, typically looks like the following, okay? We have a bunch of recordings indexed by the superscript i here. And you can see like in this data set, we have n recordings. And for each recording, we have p snapshot or p plus one snapshot in it, right? Xt, xt plus delta t all the way down to xt plus p delta t. So these are time series. Our goal <coughs> is to convert this scientific measurement data into some sort of model, maybe not in the form of differential equations. But still, we hope this model could be predictive so that we can run, for example, some time-stepping scheme on it to do the predictions. So that's the setup of the second regime of uh, like the modeling, the dynamics. This is more like a data-driven modeling regime. So in our work, there are a bunch of like methodologies for doing data-driven uh, modeling for dynamical systems. Um, for example, like the methods based on sparse regression or symbolic regression, et cetera, and et cetera. But for this work, we're gonna focus on using the artificial neural network to model the dynamics, okay? There are a bunch of uh, advantages and disadvantages of using neural network uh, against the others. Uh, I would name, uh, for example, uh, the advantage of using neural network is that uh, uh, personally, I think you can deal with the experimental data directly 
without computing any numerical time derivatives. So it's quite robust, like with respect to the data, right? Okay, so now let's talk about neural network. So what we're gonna do is to use the neural network to model what we call the flow map. But what is a neural network? The neural network is very simple. It's basically a function parameterized by some parameters theta there, okay? And you have the x as the input of the neural network. And once you feed x to the neural network, it will give you some output y's. So it's that simple. So what's special about this neural network function is that it is compositional in nature. It is a, like a sequence of operations. And for each block operation, it's basically a linear operator followed by a nonlinear activation function. So yeah, this is what the neural network is. And to use the neural network to model uh, the measurement data or the sequence data, what we're gonna do is basically, we take the data here, the D here, and uh, we assume it comes from some autonomous system in this form, which is an initial value problem. And our goal is to learn the delta t lag flow map with this neural network, okay? So you can see that uh, finally, once this is neural network is trained, uh, the goal is that if you fit this neural network with xt, the state variable at time point t is gonna give you the prediction uh, at the time point t plus delta t. So that's why I put a, like a hat here, you can see this, because this is a prediction not the real value, okay? Okay, once these neural network are trained, okay, uh, how are we gonna use it? So we're gonna feed the initial uh, snapshot x0 to the neural network, and it's gonna generate some predictions x delta t, right? And this x delta t prediction will be uh, the input of the next round, which will be fitted back to the neural network again and then it gives you the prediction at time point two delta t. And then so on and so forth, you get like uh, x two delta t here and also x three delta t, so on and so forth. So this seems to be very similar to what we have with um, mm, the physics-based simulation models where you fit the algorithm with the initial value, then with some sort of time stepping scheme you can go away like all the way to the future. But the question here is that, um, is that is that the best we can do? Are there any problems with it? Okay, so the problem is that uh, very similar to what we have in the classical numerical simulation settings, we have the error accumulations at each step. Okay, you might say, okay, this is not a big problem. We had that like uh, in the numerical uh, simulation settings, why should we worry about that? It's because we're now uh, thinking about doing data-driven modeling, which is completely different. And we have a way to eliminate this error accumulation somehow. Okay, and this brings us like to the key methodology of our work. So this picture basically shows you like the big picture of our methodology. What we're gonna do is to say, instead of training one neural network to do time stepping, as I previously showed, how about we you know, like train multiple neural network with different size of delta t's, and then somehow combine them to do the time stepping simultaneously. Okay, so, so that's the basic idea. So in this example here, we have illustrated an example with three neural networks. And you can see the red neural network is associated with uh, like this big delta t1 here. The time step is very large. And the yellow neural network here, it uh, has some sort of like an inter like intermediate value of delta t2, right? And this blue network there has some like a small delta t here. You can see that, right? This is very small they are associated with different time stepping size. Now, consider uh, once these neural networks are trained, how do we do the predictions 
of the, like the state variable at time point t, which is shown in green there. How do we do the predictions there once we feed our algorithm with the initial st state x0 here, here? OK. So what we're going to do is basically to do time stepping for four times. You can see we can do one step, one big step with this red network, and then uh, a step with the yellow network, and then two steps here with the blue networks. And then finally, we got to XT. So meaning, like we only do four times stepping to get there. If you don't have this red network and this yellow network, if you only have this blue network, what you're going to do is basically starting from this X0, you do the time stepping again and again and again, very slowly with some like uh, very small time steps. You're going to imagine, you can imagine that if you do this, the error will accumulate along the way so that once you get to XT, actually uh, your predictions, you know, may not be valid at all. So that's the key intuition of our method. We train multiple networks and we use them simultaneously. So here, the red neural network can march forward very fast. And this is the key to prevent the error accumulation when you do time stepping with these models. And the blue neural network is responsible for more accurate local predictions. What do I mean by that? So like, let's consider the case where we only have the red network, but we don't have the yellow and blue ones. If you want to go from x0 just a little bit more like to the future, maybe to here. If you only have the n red network, the best you can do is basically to take the x0 here and also uh, the first step stays here. And you do an interpolation to estimate uh, what's the state variable here. You, you basically achieve that with the, you know, the interpolation. And that's not going to be accurate because <coughs> Nothing's like uh, basically guarantee you the accuracy there. So that's where uh, the blue network gonna help. The blue network gonna complement this because the blue network can because because the blue network can just uh, shoot you just a little bit away from where you were at, and then you can get information there. So that's how we couple these two different scale networks. <coughs> okay, so. By coupling different scale networks, we actually get a very like a bonus point um, in addition to the time stepping accuracy. Uh, the bonus point is that um, we somehow circumvent the explo exploding vanishing gradient problem when we do the training of such networks. Why is that? <coughs> because like typically, uh, when people try to do time stepping using the neural networks. They go for the recurrent neural networks. And when you train the recurrent neural networks, you will have an objective function, like something looks like this, OK? This objective function. It's a mean square error of your prediction and the ground truth, OK? And you, you basically, you need to run over all the samples or all the recordings. That's what this i from 1 to n is. And also, you want to run through all the steps, j from 1 to p, OK? You can see like the j basically index like um, the future steps you're going you, you're gonna to make. If you want your single scaled neural network to predict very far from the future, you'd better choose a large p to train this, right? For example, p might be 100 or 1,000. But this is going to give you the exploding and vanishing gradient problem when you do the training. Because you basically what you do is to say, we apply this neural network again and again and again. The superscript j here uh, means like you apply the neural network for j times. When you apply this for a lot of times, then uh, when you try to use the backpropagation to compute a gradient, these gradients will typically vanish or explode depending on the eigenvalues of that system. OK, so that, that's the problem. But if you are using our proposed uh, methodology here, you don't have this problem. Why? Because when you train each individual neural network, you actually don't need a very large p there. Okay? 
think about a problem where we want to predict from like the uh, from t equals to zero to t equals to eight. If you only have the blue network, you probably need to train a blue network with p equals to eight here, so that like when you do the prediction, um, the prediction at the A step may still be accurate. But with our network, okay, with this three network, for example, this blue one is associated with one time step, the yellow one with two time steps, and the red one with four time steps. What you need to do is basically training these neural networks with P equals to two. Because this red neural network will handle like the longer scale prediction. You only need to go forward for two steps to get to t equals to eight with this red one. And like the blue one only needs to focus on its own range of interest to go two steps forward. That's all we need to do. So yeah, that's how we circumvent the exploding and vanishing gradient problem with this architecture. Now let's talk about some result from this. What I have just uh, told you about are just uh, some intuitions of that um, like proposed architecture and how that can be achieved. These are the actual accuracy we have uh, obtained in our paper. Um, there are a lot of information clearly in this plus and uh, let's see it like column by column. So the first three columns are very simple. The first column uh, are the toy nonlinear differential equation examples that we used in our experiment. And the second columns are the corresponding phase space of these systems. The third column, in the third column, basically we visualize some specific trajectories of these systems with um, like blue and red curves, okay? And on top of that, the, the black dots basically represent uh, the time stepping or, or the predictions that we generated using our multi-scale hierarchical deep learning scheme. You can see basically they agree pretty well except for the Lorentz system. So yeah, for this plot, what I really want you to focus on is actually the last column. So the last columns are the plots for the error curves. The horizontal axis represents the simulation time and the vertical axis actually represents the, the error in the logarithmic scale. And different colors represent like the different error curves for different methods. For the colored ones, you can uh, refer to the top panel here. Uh, for example, that purple one, that represents the error curve when we only use the neural network with delta t equals to one dt. So what the error looks like, that's the blue curve in each example, and so on and so forth. And most importantly, the black curve is basically the coupling results when you use all the neural network, you couple them together, what is the error curve you achieve by using this? So you can see the black curve is well below all the single scaled error curves, which means by coupling different scale neural networks, you can gain like better accuracy by doing the, like for predicting the future. Uh, another thing I want to mention is that you might ask uh, why this error curve looks so strange. You can see there's a like jungling curves there. Uh, a lot of uh, like, for example, this, a lot of uh, a local minimum here, why it, uh, the error curve looks this way in general. It is because like when you train a neural network, for example, with delta t, it only gives you very accurate predictions over the time point, which are the, uh, the multiples of these delta t's. Okay, within, for example, zero and delta t, what we do is basically do a linear interpolation to achieve those predicted values. That's why, like within zero and delta t or delta t to two delta t, you can see there's a, like a bump of the error curves. That's why it looks this way. Anyways, the key takeaway here is that this hierarchical scheme of using different scale networks can basically bring us the accuracy for doing the time stepping. So that's pretty much for the accuracy. Let's now talk about the efficiency. Okay, so are there any benefits in terms of the computational speed by using our method? It turns out, yes. Why is that? 
So before, when we think about like doing the numerical time step stepping, what we usually do is basically we start from the initial time frame here, and then we simulate it step by step, you know, a little bit, and then all the way down to the future. But right now, you can do the following. We take the initial uh, state variable and we fit it to the largest scale network, which is represented by this red one. And it will output two state variables at here and here, okay? So it can go very far away to the future. And once you get the state variables on that two red bars, you can collect them and uh, on the second level, then you can basically take this initial condition, the white one again, and also the uh, state variable at this first red bar, which is in the middle, and feed them to the yellow network. This will separately generate like this four yellow bars here. You can see that, right? Okay, so what I want to sh tell you that actually uh, when you do the second level time stepping, you can actually uh, send these two states to different computers if you are working with, for example, a distributed memory system, right? So you can do parallelization in this computation. Right now, like the time stepping schemes are not serialized in nature anymore. We can parallelize this computation um, naturally. So that's the key takeaway. And also when you finish uh, with the second level, you get those yellow bars, you can gather them uh, with the red bar and the white bar again and send it to the, like, the smallest scale network, which represented by this blue one and they will give you the simulation values or the time stepping values at those blue bars. So uh, after this step three, you will get all the state variables at different bars with different colors here. And in the end, what you're gonna do is basically take all the state variables and rearrange them so that they are in a chronicle order. So that's how we do the simulation with this kind of data-driven models and it can be parallelized in nature. What's more interesting is that the similar idea can be used to benefit uh, the classical numerical time stepping schemes as well. How are we gonna do that? Think about uh, a scenario where we want to simulate uh, a super large uh, differential equation online, okay? It's of high dimensional, very hard to simulate, but we want to do it online. What I'm gonna suggest is basically saying, okay, First, you're gonna do it, <coughs> a bunch of simulations offline with different initial conditions. Then you collect those data and use those data to train a large scale neural network. And then when you go online, you want to do some real time simulations. What you're gonna do is to first feed that initial condition to the neural network first, not just like run the simulations directly. You feed the neural network first. And this neural network gonna gives you two state variables by doing the time stepping. It will give you the two time, like the state variables uh, represented by that two red bars there, right? Which corresponds to here and there, okay? So these two. So this step is very cheap. You just uh, use the neural network and do two ste step like time stepping there. But what you have achieved is that you break this computation into different, different parts and different parts can be conducted, like the simulation of the, these parts can be conducted independently on different computers. So you can parallelize these computations using some, for example, the Runga Kata 45 time stepper in this example. All right, you, you maybe you can send this white bar state variables to a computer and this red bar in the middle to another, then you run like the typical simulations you, you, you typically run on a single computer. But these computations can be parallelized. In the end, you will also go gonna gather these blue bars and then rearrange them so that they are in a chronicle order. So that's what we call the hybrid time steppers. It can be used to accelerate uh, classic numerical simulations. Okay, now let's see some results uh, 
in terms of the efficiency, okay? And in this plot, actually there are two plots here. There are a bunch of dimensions, a lot of information in this uh, illustration as well. So first, we want to pay attention to the color. So in both of these plots, different colors represent uh, the different nonlinear system, the toy examples that we have uh, done the experiment on. For example, let's focus on this hyperbolic system, which represents uh, by this like blue dots and blue stars, and blue curves there, okay. And then let's uh, take a look at the left plot. So what the left plot tells you is that we compare all the single scale neural network time steppers against the multi-scale neural network hierarchical time stepper that we just uh, talked about previously, okay? Because like the circle represents the single scale neural networks and the star represents the multi-scale neural networks. You can basically see like in this plot, the, ho the horizontal and the vertical axis are basically the simulation time and error. They're all in logarithmic scale. And in general, these stars are well below uh, these curves. Okay, meaning um, our hierarchical scheme can be both accurate and efficient. Okay, so, so that's the takeaway from this. If you are like compared with all the single scale neural network, the hierarchical multi scale neural network scheme is both efficient and accurate. So, what about the second plot? So, for the second plot, uh, what we are comparing are the single time scale run the kata time steppers. We run a bunch of simulations with different delta t's with the run the kata 45, that time stepping scheme. And uh, those are represented by this, like the triangles uh, in this plot. And we also use the scheme that we presented in the previous slides, which is the hybrid time stepper, which is basically uh, build a neural network time stepper on top of the same Runga Kata time steppers. We want to see, are there any efficiency gain from it? What we see is that in general, these hybrid time steppers are on the top left. You see, it's on the top left over these single scale Runga Kata time steppers, meaning they are definitely more efficient. Yeah, we have this efficiency gain, but we sacrifice a little bit on accuracy. So that's the key takeaway. But I want to point it out that actually it's really not a fair comparison, right? Because like for philosophical reasons, we consider our differential equations to be the ground truth. And uh, uh, in our hybrid time step, we first train a neural network that mimi mimic the behavior of that, um, you know, the differential equations. And we then we use that neural network to generate the predictions and compare that against the ground truth, which you know, are the ones that produced from the differential equation. So it's not surprising there's a, like a deficiency in the accuracy here. Yeah, so that's pretty much for the efficiency. And also to explore like a, like a broader impact of this work, we also compared our proposed architecture against some state-of-the-art architectures nowadays. Uh, for example, the LSTM network, uh, the echo state network, uh, which is more like a reservoir computing, and uh, also the clockwork RNN. And uh, we compare them against the sequence generation task. So the sequence generation task is basically, uh, we feed the data to different architectures of the network, we train them, and then uh, once it is trained, we feed that network with the initial snapshot of some sort of sequence. And we want that network to regenerate the whole sequence. That's what we mean by sequence generation. And uh, here, uh, what I'm going to show you are basically like four videos. So we have a video sequence of a flower blooming, and we want to see like for different architectures uh, how they're going to reproduce this sequence. And uh, this HISTS basically represents the hierarchical time stepper, which is the proposed architecture in this work. And you can see for this hierarchical time steppers, it, it can almost perfect, perfectly reproduce like the sequence, the, the video sequence. 
but for the LSTM, it does like a poor job. And also the same happens for the echo state network and the clock work RNN. But the key here is not really about like the, this comp competition because we really adapt like a different philosophy when we try to do this kind of sequence generation. In the hierarchical time stepper, we're basically coupling, explicitly coupling different scale neural networks. But for all these others, they are basically recurrent neural ne network. They rely on some non-trivial dynamics which might give you some sort of memory using the gating mechanism like to, you know, to alleviate like the exploding vanishing gradient descent, pro the gradient problem. So yeah, this is one of the examples that we've shown in this paper. And there are also a bunch of other examples, including the fluid dynamics, the chaotic chaos equation, and also some audio sequences, which you can basically uh, see them in this like the, the below this link. This is a, like a YouTube link, which gives you other examples there. OK, so to summarize, uh, in this work, we have proposed a multi-scale hierarchical time stepper. Uh, it has uh, several advantages. It is highly accurate because we reduce the error accumulation problem, and it is highly efficient. It can be parallelized in nature, and it is highly flexible because it can be jointly used with the numerical time steppers to promote the efficiency of classical numerical algorithms. And in the end, it's also easy to train. When you train each individual neural network, you only need to focus on its own range of interest. You don't need to train it very far from the future. This will circumvent like the gradient exploding and vanishing problem. Yeah, okay, I think that's pretty much it. Thanks for listening.